on our list and any unspoken request. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day of your grace and mercy towards us. And as you can see, we stand before you as needy people. We just ask that the name of this mess and those that are unspoken and all of it. As we lift these names up and we shed that grace and mercy on their needs. And our prayer and hope is that they recognize from which their help comes and give you praise and glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, tonight before we look at our Bible study time, I thought we would just be reminded of that season of, of Easter that we're we're coming into. And you know, there's a little bit of an updated version of the song called Because He Lives. Um, Matt Marr kind of redid that one. So but if you'll turn up the, the volume on the computer side, uh, it, it, is it muted on that side? I'm not hearing any. I don't know. Maybe, maybe that song's not going to work for us tonight. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what we'll do then. We can pull out the hymn book. And, and, and sing the hymn version of Because He Lives. And that is on page 407. 407. This morning I have an opportunity to uh, give a Bible study with a men's group. And... And there was probably about 40, 42 men, I think, in there this morning in that uh, Bible study group. And those guys sang the chorus part to this song together. And it was so good to, to hear, you know, just a, a, a room full of men just lifting up their voice to the Lord because he lives. But, um, but we can sing the, the first and last verses um, of, of the hymn here. So we'll have to do this a cappella. So why don't y'all stand with me and we'll, we'll try this together. You ready? God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal and forgive. He lived and died to my my Bible, 
Let me invite you to turn with me to the book of Revelation in chapter 17 as we wrap up chapter 17 tonight. We spent some time in the first few verses trying to wrap our minds around some of the symbolism, some of the imagery that John is, is seeing in, in this vision as the, the angel begins to, to show him um, this woman who's sitting on a, or riding on a scarlet beast and, and what all that means. And so we've, we've taken the first uh, part of that, th this woman that, that's called the prostitute or the harlot, and we have discovered that it's symbolic of the false religion that is going to permeate uh, all over the earth during the time of the Great Tribulation. And so it's a false religion. Verse 1 says she sits on many waters. Later on, we find out that the waters represent what? Do you remember? The people, the nations of the earth. The angel gives the interpretation of what the waters meant as the people or the nations of the earth. And so all the nations of the earth are buying into this false religion. Um, where it says that she sleeps with many kings. And that's just a way of saying that there's this merit, kind of a, a, a relationship between politics and religion. And it's all going to get intermingled in this new world religion, new world government, or, or what some have called the new world order. And then D was she influences the majority of people. So people from all over the world are influenced or buying in to this false religion during the, the tribulation. And she's sitting on the scarlet beast, which we're going to talk about in detail here in just a minute. Um, chat, verse 4 talked about her being drenched in wealth. So talked about gold and silver. There's, there, while people are starving to death, these um, world leaders are living in the lap of luxury, so to speak. And, and so there, there's going to be some wealth, at least in the beginning. But at the end of the verse, it says that she's drinking in the wickedness, the blasphemies that uh, this false religion is, is, is proclaiming against the one true God. Uh, because it's a religion driven by, uh, by Satan. And, and so there's wickedness, it's vile, it's blasphemous to the one true God. Um, no one all, you know, will, will want to name the name of, of Christ, of Jesus Christ. Um, so the H on that list was she was the mother of all false religions. So all the religions of the world are going to kind of come together uh, uh, under this one false religion. And the, um, the beast that is the, called the false prophet, not this scarlet beast, but the, the beast from the earth that we had read about earlier. And then the last thing we talked about in, in verse 6 was that she uh, slaughters the saints. So the 144,000 that are the witnesses that are left in the world, God has put his mark on them, and they are protected. They are protected from the bowls of wrath and all the terrible things that are happening on the earth. And they are continuing to, to share Christ. They're continuing to share the gospel throughout the tribulation. And people are coming to Christ, some. And so, but, but if a person names the name of Christ and puts their faith in Jesus um, during the tribulation, their life is going to be on the line. So, that's where we had gotten to was to verse 6. Now, let's pick up with verses 7 and 8. Uh, tonight and then following and we'll pick up in, in verse 7 in Re uh, Revelation 17 verse 7 the angel said to me why are you astonished why do you marvel at what you've seen uh, the angel says I will explain to you the mystery of the woman I know what that is. 
battery is going down. <clears throat> turn, turn the pulpit on and we'll turn this one off. All right. Should have checked that battery before we, we got up here. All right, so... This one isn't even on, so there may be a short. There may be a short. In Well, that, that's, that was a quick fix. And that maybe we won't hear all that popping now. It's so good. I apologize for that. So, the angel uh, asks John, you know, why are you astonished? Why are you amazed? Why marvel? And so, I'm going, the angel says, I'm going to explain the mystery of the woman and, the, and of the beast with the seven heads and the ten horns that carries her. Verse 8 says, the beast that you saw was and is not and is about to come up from the abyss and go to destruction. Some of your translations use the word perdition. Perdition, that's not really a, a word that we use you know, very often anymore. Um, a little bit of an old English word, perdition. Um, but, but perdition is, is just another word for for destruction, uh, bad things are, you know happen, is, is what perdition means. And then it says, "Those who live on the earth, whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, will be astonished when they see the beast that was, and is not, and is to come." So that sounds like a lot to unpack right there. So why don't we pause and, and try to work our way through that. So if you have your outline, I'll give you some of those fill in the blanks. And then we'll, we'll kind of talk through some of this to see if we can better understand what these things mean. So we're on number two in your outline. Number two is the, the scarlet beast, the scarlet beast. So write that in. And A is... Uh, tells us who this scarlet beast is. Who is the scarlet beast? The Antichrist. So write that in. He is the Antichrist. And from your notes in your outline, jot these things down, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about it. So back in Revelation 13, we were introduced to this beast from the sea that was the Antichrist. Right here in verse 8, that we read a moment ago that really reiterates what chapter 13 had said uh, about how the beast is apparently killed and comes back to life. Now, some argue whether or not that's actual death or where it's a kind of make-believe to... Uh, to give the impression of having died and coming back to life, but we don't know. So there, there is some evidence that there's at least uh, the appearance, if not the actual, you know, killing of this individual, the Antichrist. Now, in your outline, it also says this, this is the best imitation of Jesus Christ and will cause people to worship him as the long-awaited Messiah. But he's not, is he? The Messiah has already come, the Lord Jesus. But what is the, what is the devil always doing? He's, he's trying to mimic or take the place of 
the Lord Jesus. That's why he's called Antichrist. Anti not only means against, but it can also mean in the place of. He wants to be the object of worship. Now, the next paragraph, verse 8, that, that talked about the beast, the, the angel is describing this beast that you saw uh, and, and is not and is about to come up from the abyss. That beast was and is not and is to come. What does all that mean? Well, again, apparently or, or figuratively, um, it is pointing to the fact that that this beast being raised from the dead. So that would be your next fill in the blank raised from the dead. He uh, he will be filled once he apparently if 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 this is actual death. Then at that point, he's filled with or indwelt with um, this demonic. Um, now, some have said even Satan himself. But, you know, if demons can, um, you know, can, can take um, possession of, of people's bodies, like, you know, Jesus cast out demons, right? So, so. The, the devil, Satan, really is another demonic being. So he himself could take possession of an individual. So some have suggested that even Satan himself. But regardless, the Antichrist is absolutely controlled by Satan, whether that's one of his, his higher demons or Satan himself. Now, the timing when, when all that will happen, if you went back to Revelation chapter 11 and verse 7, uh, Barry Britt suggests that, that that's when this is happening. The timing of this is going to be after the two witnesses are killed. Because the Antichrist has to do with killing the two witnesses. Now, so the Antichrist is, is on the scene um, and, and apparently part of this. Uh, well, let's do this. Let's just keep working our way through the outline and we'll answer some questions as we, as we come along. I'm, I'm trying not to jump ahead too much. So we just stay with what we've got and then we'll answer some questions later if we need to come back to them. Now, B in your outline is this. He carries the harlot. So the scarlet beast, the, the harlot or the prostitute is right in this vision that John is seeing that he doesn't quite understand what he's seeing, but he's, he's writing down what he sees. There's the woman, the prostitute riding on this red scarlet beast. And in verse seven the angel's asking, why are you astonished? Why are you amazed at this? Why, why do you marvel? And, and that's when the angel says, I'm going to explain the mystery to you. And, and he talks about the woman uh, and, and the beast and the, the seven heads and the ten horns. So John is marveling in amazement at all of the information that's being revealed to him as anyone would. But then the angel further explains the mystery of the vision. So that's your next fill in the blank, the mystery of the vision. The Antichrist doesn't care about the harlot. The Antichrist it doesn't, doesn't care uh, about this false religion, but only uses her or it to bring people together to eventually worship whom? Himself. Satan doesn't care what people believe as long as it isn't the truth. As long as it isn't the truth. The gospel is the only belief that is not under his umbrella of false religion. Now, if you turn the page over, we're going to get to verse 9 uh, and following. 
So we'll take uh, 9 through, through about 14. Now, beginning in verse 9, again, the, the angel is speaking to John and says, This calls for a mind that has wisdom. And he's going to begin to explain what some of these things mean. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. They are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must remain for only a little while. The beast that was and is not is itself an eighth king. But it belongs to the seven and is going to, to uh, destruction, or again, perdition. The ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but they will receive authority as kings when the beast, uh, with the beast for one hour. These have one purpose, and they give their power and authority to the beast. These will make war against the lamb, but the lamb will conquer because will conquer them because he's the Lord of lords and king of kings. Those with him are called chosen and faithful. So let's pause right there and unpack some of this. So first, let's just go back to the outline. We'll fill in their blanks and then we'll, we'll see if there's anything that we need to, to kind of fill in the gaps. So in verse 9, um, just as... You know, Jesus explained parables to his disciples. Now the angel is explaining the symbols of this vision in a way that John can interpret it. So you have seven heads on seven mountains. And we talked about this a little bit last week. This is a geographical and political reference to the revival of the Roman empire and its influence and dominance in the world using religion now we know that ancient rome was founded on seven cities that were on seven hills and all of those were combined into one great city uh, the the city of rome and so that's where we get that interpretation from that it's the Roman Empire, the revival of the Roman Empire because of the seven hills. And we're not making this stuff up. It's right there in Scripture. And those who would have read this letter from John in the, in the first, really the very late first century into the second century, they would have understood when it said seven hills. Oh, yeah, I know where that is. They said it would have made sense to them. So then we get to verses 10 and 11 that talks about the seven kings. So the seven kings likely refer to the seven great world powers that had led to this moment in time. So what are those seven? So there's a whole list and you can write these in. So if you go back into ancient empires, the first really great empire was the Egyptian the Egyptian Empire, and, you, and, and we run all, you go all the way back to Genesis, and we begin to read about the Egyptians, and, and even Abraham going into Egypt and dealing with the, the king of Egypt and the pharaohs, and then all throughout with, with Moses, and um, so a lot of history there with, with Egypt, and then the Assyrian, the Assyrian Empire. Uh, was the next kind of great empire of, of this region of the world. And then came along um, the Babylonian Empire. Nebuchadnezzar, remember King Nebuchadnezzar from Daniel. And so he came along and, and his army destroyed the Assyrian Empire and, and took that into his own empire. And then came the Persians. Now, you know where some of these places are in the world today? Are you familiar with that? You know, the Babylonians and the Persians, you know who those are? 
The Babylonians would have been the Iraqis. The Persians are Iranian, Iran. So all, you know, these nations go way back in time. And then after the Persian Empire was the Greeks, Alexander the Great, who came along and, and, and took over um, everything in sight that he could get his hands on and, and made it as, as far as India before he died at the ripe old age of, anybody know? How old was Alexander the Great when he conquered the world, the, the known world of his day? He was 33 when he died. Quite an accomplishment for a man in his early 30s. So then after the Greeks were the Romans. Now those are the five that um, had already been and one had, or I'm sorry, the, the five that had already been up through Greece and the one that is is Rome. So that's six, and then there's one to come that made seven, and that's the kingdom of the Antichrist. And then it said that there was an eighth who was part of the seven. And the interpretation there is if the Antichrist is killed, but then comes back to life and regains power, then... Some believe then, then he's not only the seventh, he's also the eighth. Because it says that he was, all, he was already part of the seventh. Gets a little confusing when you're reading through that. But, but that's, what, um, that's what some folks suggest. That the Antichrist being revived um, is also the eighth. The eighth being the Antichrist who rises again to absolute power in the world. It's a way to say that all of the ungodly kingdoms of the world have been under the sway of Satan. So, do we get that last one? Uh, back up one. D did I miss one under the sway of Satan? Okay, so I apologize. Every now and then one, one gets deleted or something. I'm but it, that last line of that second paragraph should read, under the sway of Satan. Now in verse 12, we read about the ten horns. What are the ten horns? It, it's a ten nation alliance that is yet to be determined. Because that, that's what he says, that, that they don't exist yet at the time of John writing this, right? So he says, you know, five, uh, five had fallen of, of, the, of the horns. I'm sorry. So the seven kings, five had fallen. One is, that was Rome. The other is not yet to come is yet to come that's the antichrist and and when he comes he must remain for a little while but then verse 11 says the beast uh, was and is not it is itself the eighth king so that's where some people believe he dies he's assassinated comes back to power again um, because he belongs to the seven and, and is going to perdition to destruction now, verse 12, the 10 horns you saw are 10 kings who have not yet received a kingdom. So who are the, who are the 10, who, who is this 10 nation alliance? Anybody got an idea? I don't know either. Now there's, there's speculation just like anything that hasn't yet happened. You know, there, you know, there, there's, uh, you know, NATO, there, there are nations that come together in an alliance. Is that what's being, you know, talked about here? I don't know for sure. But a lot of people believe it's a European 
uh, a league of European nations? Maybe. But regardless, Scripture tells us there's going to be an alliance of ten nations, ten kingdoms or kings that come together. And says they, that their power won't last very long. When it says an hour, you know, that, that, that's not real long. But that's symbolic to say that once they come into power, they're almost immediately just going to hand it all over to the Antichrist. And so they're going to lead their nations. These rulers are going to lead their nations to, um, to join up with the Antichrist. So the ten nations will not be known, I'm sorry, will be known when the time comes. Don't know who they are now for sure, but there will definitely be a ten nation alliance. Now at the midpoint of the tribulation, the mid midpoint is the three and a half year mark, somewhere right there. They're going to sur surrender and submit all of their authority and allegiance to the one world ruler, the Antichrist. And we studied about this. Um, as we study about this, Britt says that uh, this chapter, it, it seems as though the Antichrist and Satan are unbeatable. But notice the subtle reminders throughout these verses that tell the end that we already know. What do we know the end is going to be? Jesus is King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and nothing's going to you know, overpower him. You know, God wins. Jesus wins. He's King of Kings. He's Lord of Lords. So, so in the end, as we get to chapter 19, when God puts an end to all of this, tribulation, the Antichrist... When Christ comes again in his second coming, God is going to deal with all of that, the beast and, and all of that once and for all. So the Antichrist is going to be dealt with. All of those who are following him are going to be dealt with in God's judgment. Satan at that time, what's going to happen to him? He's going to be bound for the thousand years of the millennial kingdom. And then at the end of the thousand years of the millennial reign of Christ on the earth, uh, God's going to release him for a, a short period of time. And he's going to try to um, seduce the nations again. He's going to do what he does. And, um, and then finally, uh, God's going to put a stop to that and, um, and cast Satan and Hades, the place of the dead, that, that um, the abyss is going to cast all of that into the lake of fire. So we're going to get there. That'll be the ultimate. And now we're, now we're done with Satan. We're done with all that forever. Um, but until that time comes, we haven't made it there yet. We're going to get there. But let's, you know, we're trying to wrap our minds around what some of these things mean during the tribulation time right now. So, um, so let's talk about C. This is the last part, the last few verses from 15 to 18, and then we'll wrap it up tonight. So, uh, he also said to me, that is the angel, the waters you saw where the prostitute was seated are the peoples, the multitude, the nations, and languages. The ten horns you saw and the beast will hate the prostitute, the harlot. They will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to carry out his plan by hate, having one purpose and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman you saw in that great city that has royal power over the kings of the earth. Now. The one we saw is the great city, which we're going to find out is Babylon. So it's just going to change. We're going to change the names from talking about the harlot to Babylon in chapter 18. But let's just back up and, and see what we've got here in these last few verses. So um, I, I like how when I was reading, studying through this, um, 
Pastor David Dykes in his um, in his commentary on this section, he said it this way. He says, "Surprise! The horse that she's riding is going to buck her off." <laughs> now you have to understand that uh, this David Dykes, not the one that's uh, who's related to another David Dykes. <laughs> that's right. That I remember you telling me that. But this uh, Pastor Dykes was in uh, Texas. So he's a Texan. And um, so he would, he would, of course, write about horses and, and bucking, uh, bucking off. But, but that's the picture. If, if the harlot, the prostitute, this false religion is riding on the beast, the scarlet beast, which is the Antichrist. That means he's carrying her along until he's done, until he's got all that he needs from her. And then, 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 she's, then she's out. Now, David Dykes writes it this way. He says, any good politician uses all his allies to their advantage. And this is exactly what the Antichrist does. He will use the apostate religious system to establish world domination. That should be the next screen. It's a backup one. There you go. To establish world domination. But the time is going to come when he will no longer need religious Babylon. Now he calls it Babylon here, even though in chapter 18 is where we, we really get into that language. He's, he, he will no longer want to share his power, so he's going to turn on it and destroy it. So while the Antichrist is using this world religion to help him gain power, once he has that power and then he wants to, to receive the worship himself, then, then he's got to squash the rest of that false religion and get everything into one, his, his religion to worship him. So he squashes the, 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 the harlot. Um, there, she's devoured um, and burned up and destroyed. Now, the next paragraph says that, and we're back to, uh, to Barry Britt's uh, commentary. He says, this is the climactic moment when the Antichrist will consume the harlot. That, had been, that he has, or I'm sorry, that has ridden him to his position of absolute power over all the, of the world. When he has complete control over the media, and a lot of fill in the bank blanks here, but it's just kind of for emphasis. What will the Antichrist control? Everything, the media, world governments, politicians, the temples, the religious centers of the world, the temples and synagogues and churches. Because believe me, there are some churches that call themselves a church that still don't know Jesus. The priests, the pastors, the rabbis, the imams, the religious leaders of those churches and synagogues and temples, and even all the military power. He's going to have it all. And he will stand in the temple. Remember, they, they, he's already encouraged the rebuilding of the temple on, on the mount in Jerusalem, right? On the temple mount. We've already talked about that. And he's going to stand there in the temple and, and, and declare himself to be God. And demand that not only uh, allegiance, but absolute worship. And this is when the, that ecumenical movement we talked about last week, where, where all kind of religions kind of mingle together. Like, yeah, we're all worshiping the same God. You do your thing and we'll do our thing. Um, he's going to squash that because he's going to say, I'm that God. Worship me. And so... The last thing there, that ecumenical movement that's, that said that all religions are equal, is replaced 
with or fulfilled in the Antichrist being the God of all religions. He will blasphemously declare that he is the one and only true God, little g, and demand that all worship him alone. So that's where all this is headed to. Now the final, the last paragraph here is from uh, Dr. Warren Worsby's commentary on, on this same um, this same section. And, and it, I like how Dr. Worsby always brings it home. In his commentary, he said, you know, this is what these things mean. We believe they mean. But what does it mean for us today? How should we react to these things? So Worsby wrote this way. He said, finally, note that those who trust the Lord are not influenced by the harlot or defeated by the kings. Once again, John points out that true believers are the overcomers. They are the overcomers. Because King Jesus has overcome. And so let, let's keep reading here. Um, Satan's counterfeit religion is subtle, requiring spiritual discernment to recognize it. So spiritual discernment, that's the next word. It was Paul's great concern that the local churches that he founded not be seduced away from their sincere devotion to Christ. So in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, let me just uh, read that for you real quick here. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul writes it this way. He says, I, I wish you would put up with, with a little foolishness from me. And, and he said that tongue in cheek because... There were some in the church who were accusing him of being foolish. And they're coming out of this whole Greek um, mentality. We we'll have time to unpack all of that. But anyway, he says, yes, do put up with me. For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy because I have promised you in marriage to one husband to be to present a pure virgin to Christ. He's talking about the church and its relationship to the Lord Jesus, the church being the bride of Christ. He's saying, listen, I want to present you pure and holy before the Lord. You know, not as, you know, not like the, the prostitute who's gone after other religions. He, in verse 3 says, but I fear that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your minds may be seduced from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if a person comes and preaches, or if you receive a different spirit, which, is not, which you had not received, or a different gospel, which you have not accepted, you put up with it splendidly. He just, he's just calling them out to say, listen, there, there's some people coming in to your churches and they're preaching a different gospel than the, than the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and, and there's only one way to deal with that. Eradicate it. Get it out. Cut it out. Do away. Don't go there. And so all throughout the New Testament, as Paul writes to the churches, he, he always includes that word of warning that... Uh, apostate um, religious leaders are going to come along and try to seduce you into believing, you know, some other things. Don't don't do it. Um, and and so here's the last thing he says here in your paragraph. In every age, there's a tremendous pressure to conform to popular religion and to abandon. The fundam fundamentals of the faith. D do we see that in the world today? I mean, churches that are 
that kind of you know flirt with being more like the world than they are being like scripture and those churches are often very attractive you'll get a you know a tv evangelist a tv preacher who's a pastor over you know one of these mega churches and and listen folks be careful when you turn those things on just be be careful I, there are a handful of, of godly men that men, when their programs are on and I get to hear it, I mean, every morning when I drop Wesley off at school and, and those five, five to ten minutes I have from the high school back to here, I get to catch the first five to ten minutes of Charles Stanley's message. I never get to finish it out. And I'm like, that first five minutes was worth it. Because there's some good and godly stuff in there. When I hear Adrian Rogers and, and, and men like that, men of God who are preach the truth of God's word, man, I you know I, I perk up to that. I listen to that. My my spirit is fed by that. But but there are some guys on on television and um, and, and have mega churches, and, and I listen just for a few minutes, and I'm going, oh, there's red flag, red flag, red flag. You know, because when you know the word. That's when the red flags within discernment comes in. It's those that don't really know the word that are, that are sucked in and seduced. So you've got to read the word. Be so, be so in tune with the word of God that anything that's not of God is like a red flag. And, and so that's the, the importance of being in the word of God. Because entire churches are being led astray with false doctrine. And it's a really sad reality. And that's why Paul writes to Timothy, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. And he said it all over again. He says, listen, the world is going to go after this false doctrine, but you don't do it. And you don't let your people do it. Teach them the truth, Paul says. Teach them God's word and remain true to the Lord. So... I don't know if we answered all the questions. Do you have any questions? I know there's a, lot of, there's a lot of stuff in here to unpack. And we've taken a few weeks to kind of get through this one chapter because there's so much there. Any, any questions you have tonight? I, I know that, the, that Putin and Xi from China were having their, their summit deal uh, the last couple of days i did not hear about documents that they may have signed today i just hadn't they called it a new world order that's interesting it yeah you know it, it's right here it's going to happen and um you know we've been saying for years you know we're living in the last days right so signs of the times for sure. Any other questions? All right. Well, good. Well, let's pray and, and we'll be dismissed. Father in heaven, again, we, we thank you for your word and the warning that you've given us to let us know that all of these things are going to happen. You've already said it. It's just a matter of time. And we also know that Second Peter they're going to be scoffers. There's always the scoffers in the world who, who will say, yeah, I don't believe any of that because it hadn't happened yet. And it's been going on 2000 years. You've been saying the same thing for 2000 years, but Lord, we know, and we believe your word is true because it's timeless. 2000 years is nothing. Uh, a thousand years is as a day to you. And so I just pray that you would help us to, to really be in tune with your word and not be seduced by the things of the world by things that tickle our ears that, that kind of sound right and have a little bit of truth to them but god you we, we know they're not of you and so help us to to be discerning in our spirits so that we can speak truth in, into other people's lives because I, I believe that's why you've you have us here in this last age for a reason for such a time as this just like you had Queen Esther 
in her day to save her people for such a time as this. You've placed us right here today and, and help us to be faithful in, in the task that you've given us to, to share the good news of Jesus before it's too late. So again, uh, bless all these who are here tonight and the families represented in our church and those who are sick and in need. And bring us back together on Sunday where we can gather around the Word of God. We can sing songs of praise to you and offer up our prayers uh, to you in, in an act of worship. And uh, we'll be blessed by that. So we, we look forward to your coming. Like the Apostle John said, even so, Lord Jesus, come. We look forward to it. But until that day comes, find us faithful in Jesus' name. Amen.